Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Harvey Shaker and uh, Bob Crone and Tere Arazi for uh, putting this wonderful thing together. That's an A team, if I've ever seen one. I think it is, in fact, a movement, if you will, when uh, Yavid Shaker thought about how can we bring people together internationally and globally on the issue of education. So, uh, so while I agree with my colleague in King's College about the impact factor. It's what you do that makes the impact. And sometimes we are really too bogged down with the idea of how to cite these things and how, in fact, you can use the usual academic measurements. But it's what you're going to be doing that makes a big difference. Now, this is a very big issue. And let me just begin by saying that I'm not an educator although I'm a great fan of education, having been involved with it in many, many years. Um, so let me just introduce myself. I'm really a physician scientist and had been in some of the best institutions in the world, having the chance to work with so many of you. Kelly Skeff, for example, at Stanford when I was there. And uh, right now I'm at the, used to be called Institute of Medicine. As of July 2015, uh, a change, through a change in constitution of the National Academies, we're now known as the National Academy of Medicine. So you may find the IOM name disappear, replaced by the NAM name. Uh, that being said, uh, we actually not only a membership organization electing some of the very finest and distinguished uh, uh, people in health and medicine, but also we really do many policy issues. And in this context, I feel that our work is to serve our nation and also globally. And being a physician interested in what's in the future, certainly for me, education is very important. So under my watch for the next four, six year period, I certainly would be very interested in working with many of you, think how to advance the issue of education. You saw, for example, 2003, the IOM put forward a report on health profession educations. And I'll talk a little bit about the things that we continue to do. But let me just set the stage for today by saying that what I'm going to talk about are things that you think a lot about, which is, first of all, the world is really changing. And we're looking at tremendous rapid changes in landscape of health and medicine. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we providing or are we educating the providers of the future? Because Quite frankly, all those changes are not going to happen without, in fact, the providers and the providers with competencies and skill set that we need to address. And of course, in this particular audience, it's not only the US question or the UK question or the European question, it's a global question. And I think that I'm sure that Havid will want to have even more diversified audience in this group representing Africa, many others, to really come together to say, this is a forum that we can learn from each other. This forum we can exchange ideas. And this is a forum by which we can begin to set standards together. And I think that I know is in fact his vision. Now let me just, because of what I do therefore, tell you in one slide what's going on. And you know all this. Disease burden, rapidly increasing, non-communicable diseases, aging, is a significant factor as the baby boomers are now reaching clearly the elderly stage. And we're looking at tremendous demand in health and health care, together with the continued existence in health discrepancies, not only internationally, but even within each country. And of course, more recently, emerging and re-emerging infections, pandemics, epidemics, etc. This is coupled with a change in urbanization, climate change, globalization, and of course advances in science and technology that we've never seen before, from information technology to human gene editing, to data and uh, the need to acquire information, and ultimately the empowerment of patients and their family that democratizes health. This has all happened so rapidly that as I was speaking to Eric, uh, Combo earlier about physician burnout and the stress, you can see that all our providers have to adapt to all these changes in the environment 
while they're trying to care for their patients as well. So it's in that context, when you look at the challenges we face every day, we face these three issues, it's, which is a modified form of the triple A, access, quality, and affordability. And I will surmise to you that no country has been able to address all three, maybe two. And of course, in our country, we're struggling to address this with a change in the Affordable Care Act, et cetera. Now, what does that all mean? It means that we're really in a period of rapid changes and reformation, if not transformation. We've got to do things differently. So it means healthcare has to change. And in every country, and you know, we know about what's going on in NHS now with the young doctors you know, on strike. I mean, every country is struggling with so many of these issues, but we have to get there by changing the way we care for patients. That requires research innovation. And this is, in fact, part of this whole forum, is think about new ways of doing things. And of course, importantly, health education reform. Now, what we do know is what's going on. I think most of us agree that healthcare has to expand in the direction of community and primary care. That, in fact, we need new models of healthcare, which is more integrated between primary care, public health, and therefore an emphasis on population health. We know that we need to engage patients a lot more and empower them the so-called democratization of health. We also know the really important issue of data, information system, electronic health record that's connected, clinical decision-making, workflows, finances, engagement, and intelligent innovation. And of course, now coming right in the horizon is personalized and precision medicine, which will be yet another tool that we need to learn. And of course, let's not forget prevention wellness. So what does it mean for today, this meeting? I think it's about providing or preparing to provide us for the future, where that individual or individuals can handle all these issues in a team-like fashion, if not individually, that can improve the health of the patients and the community we serve. So, education must meet two issues, capacity and competence. Now, in our country, we think more around the competence. I still think we have a lot of issues of capacity. But when you think about global issues, capacity becomes a critically important issue. So I think we all know the slide. You've talked about this. You as the educator leaders, I'm sure you talk about this, that today we teach disease-centered care. It's highly acute care emphasis, fragmented, not enough teamwork and usually episodic encounters when you see the patient in the hospital, then continuous care all the way to their home. And that this insufficient understanding of what's happening in the community. Someone pointed out to me that, in fact, in a year, an uh, average patient spent about maybe three, four hours with the providers and 85,000 hours at home. So you can imagine not understanding the amount of time and where you spend most of your time how can we actually improve community health? And of course, um, low training on the use of information systems, although the good news is, I think the new generation is gonna have much less problem than our generation, and a mismatch of competencies to patient and population needs. So, I think many of us, and I particularly in this room, all of you have asked this question. What are the competency skills needed for the emerging care delivery models, and how can we all, all the stakeholders come together to address this issue about changing education for the future? Now, I was very fortunate to be asked by the White House, together with Nancy Nielsen, uh, a few years ago after the passage of Affordable Care Act, knowing that we're going to change things, how can we train clinicians for a transformed delivery system? And I would say that what I'm about to say is now rings true by so many other work done by so many other experts. And so I'm just going to take a word to say that we all recognize, not only through that work but others, that we need to modernize health education, which is first teamwork. It's putting the patient in the center and working as a team around the patient. It's not a doctor-centric model anymore. 
but also new competencies that actually allows the providers having the skill set to address some of the issues, like managing the health of the population. A much better understanding of pop public health and role of communities, uh, understanding epidemiology, transitions of care, and of course, high-risk patients. The practice of cost-conscious care, really important issue. You're never going to be able to reach the goals of providing access of care to everyone if you don't address the cost of care. And the cost of care is greatly dependent on the providers, how they make decisions. So transparency and accountability, principles of cost-effective care using evidence base, and of course, understanding at least a basic economics, health economics, which I think is important if you want to be a good provider. Also importantly is understanding the policy. Now, you know, I'm a physician. I, most of my life I do work in research, patient care, and then more, of course, administration. But in my new role, I understand how important policy is. And you heard earlier from Peter and others about policy. If you get involved, as we do at the IOM or NNM, where we can actually determine policies, it is actually paid attention, at least in our country, by Congress and by others. Social determinants of health, the business of medicine, social and behavioral sciences, professionalism, and most importantly, um, importantly is leadership. Like you, we need to train leaders who actually can step up and transform the way we do things and not just followers. And of course, great accountability in terms of outcomes, cost, patient experience, and measurement at the individual practice and system level. To be accountable to the public, what we do is, uh, is worthwhile. So I think that it's clear in the summary slide quickly that what we need in health profession education are new competencies, which is the inclusion of understanding social determinants of health. Because in my role, in my last job at Duke, I'm absolutely convinced when people come to me and say, how do you really improve the population health, individual health? I say it lies in the social issues that we face with. Until we address that, we're never going to be able to achieve those goals. So we as health providers need to step up to be involved with the other issues in social issues, such as poverty, such as living environment, such as clean water, such as education. Primary care and public health, which is one of our reports to say, you need to closely integrate this. You can't see there's a discontinuous issue that someone's out there doing public health surveillance and we're in there in the hospital taking care of patients. It's a continual issue. The use of new technology, data collection and analysis, policy systems, leadership management, and importantly, interprofessional and collaborative skills. So when I think about this bigger picture of this meeting in global needs, in that setting where nobody would disagree that that's where we need to be, you have to understand that countries are very different and resources are very different. This is where the capacity and competence are both important. The Lancet Commission, which we were involved at IOM, is actually one of those who support Lancet Commission. Uh, Ulio Frank, who's now the president of the University of Miami, and others led this commission. This slide is very telling. If you want to look at the future of health and solve the problem of health professions, you have to see, in fact, the cap capacity and distribution of first on A, the population, B, the burden of disease, third, the number of medical school, and fourth, the workforce. As you can see, there's a great disproportion where you look at the bottom two, C and D, the heavy font are actually the lowest numbers. So Africa, with the greatest disease burden, have the lowest number of medical school and health professions, as you can look through, you know, in Asia and many other areas. Also in that study, when you look at the distribution of uh, providers, you can see where the population are globally, 50-50, rural, urban, nurses, physicians, we certainly have a male distribution and we'll never be able to actually make that impact that we would like to see unless we begin to address these issues. And of course, in the background of all this is the SDG. 
the great goal that's going forward, in which universal health coverage is now agreed upon by every country, some 500 leading health and development organizations, all said post-2015, we're now in 2016, that there should be universal health coverage everywhere globally. Now, I would say, I'm proud to say, even our country, the Affordable Care Act has now covered an extra 17 million of people who were previously uninsured. We're now at close to 90% of the population covered in the United States. It's very controversial politically, but I think it's the right thing to do. But imagine that you have to do universal coverage to everybody. What does that really mean? That means you really have to think about education and the issue of capacity distribution, as well as competency. This Lancer report, which I ask you to read, makes a very important issue. Our role in health education is to provide the workforce that meet the health system needs. Not just out there, you know, training people out here without relevance to what really is needed in the community. Consequently, if you look at this slide, the education system, the health system, has to be moving hand in hand, or hand in glove, looking at demands and supply and the need of the population. In this context, we all know that there's a shortage of physicians. How do we address this issue? I think it's really about health profession, I was asked earlier, not medical profession alone. Health profession education, addressing a right skilled and efficient workforce. This statement, which uh, we wrote at IOM says, really we should enable all health professionals to practice at the maximum potential. I, as a doctor, do not subscribe to the medical profession position that nurses shouldn't do certain things, etc. I think we need to get everybody to practice at the maximum of their potential and work as a team. In that context, we put out a report in uh, 2014 on graduate medical education. Controversial report. I was talking to Eric this morning. Some people don't like it, but I think we have to tell the truth, which means that we have even grown substantially. You know, the amount of dollars this U.S. spend on graduate education is the billions. I think $10 billion a year, maybe more. And yet, we've really not reached the kind of needs, met the needs of the population, particularly in primary care, underserved population, and others. In that report, we said we need more focus on efficiency, quality, and outcomes. We need to move more towards community, not just hospital-based training. We need to say adding more positions is not the solution alone. We need to move to better distribution and also a better integrated team-like approach. Innovation is critically important. The dollars spent a percent of it should be towards new ideas, new innovation, encouraging trainees as well as leaders to think about new things to move things better. And of course, we should really think about, and this is to the government, to our Congress, guidance, incentives, not control. Now, there are many sub-themes in this which are controversial, but I think the message is things cannot be the same as we are today. Importantly, we also had a very important report led by Donna Shalala, who was a previous Secretary of uh, Health Human Services and the President of the University of Miami. This report is the most downloaded report ever in our history of IOM reports. And, you know, I would say easily, uh, you know, 250,000, even more. And it's a must read for most nurses. But the issue is to say nursing has a big role. And I think in too many countries, when I travel, nurses are here, doctors are there, but nurses are the ones who interface with the patients. So we said they should practice the full uh, extent of the education, high levels of education, more baccalaureate, master's degree, PhDs, and now, of course, DNP, doctor of nurse practice. They should be full partners with providers and, of course, effective workforce required team-based approach. And, of course, finally, we need to think about other forms of providers. Obviously, the obvious ones are pharmacists, social workers, but community health workers, as shown here in Lenest, China, they train volunteer professionals 
to provide non-communal chronic disease management control with a variety of activities and to better integrate them to low-cost improve healthcare. And so this leads to this discussion of interprofessional practice. The dominant model even today is we bring the doctors and nurses and the public health together when you now begin to take care of patients, what we call teamwork. But interprofessional training right now is bringing people together in education, mostly by short exposure and simulation. I think the future is transprofessional, which is truly looking at core competencies and specific uh, competencies, system systematic teamwork, and also including community professions. In this context, we have a global forum on innovation in health professional education, where there's 62 members, 18 professions, eight different countries, and 45 sponsors. And many of you have read two of our reports on interprofessional education for collaboration and establishing transprofessionalism. I think this message is so important. This message is talking about shared social contract that is not really only providing care for the patient, but that we as a profession need to create and carry out a shared social contract with the community that, that in fact are worthy of trust of patients and the public. So I'm going to end by saying there are really six principles of health education reform. Cultivate curiosity, problem identification, problem solving, and life lifelong learning. Center around interprofessional and transdisciplinary team-based care. Around align the curriculum with patient population needs, particularly social in terms of health. Sites of training from hospital out towards the community. Train high value cost conscious care. That means be conscious of the cost of care and provide the best cost you, uh, that care that you can give and certainly competencies and milestones. Now, so that means at least for the undergraduate education, we have to shift from classroom to participation a didactic model to critical thinking and traditional discipline teaching to integrated comprehensive and interdisciplinary pathways for learning. And also, innovation has to be a very critical part of what we do. Not just incremental improvement, but the willingness to look at flipped classroom as we uh, experimented at Duke National University Singapore Medical School simulations that many of you are doing, self-driven learning, and of course, democratization of education altogether. Now, to do this, I say all of us, particularly people like myself, who's been the leader of health system and of medical schools, and now at the academy, to look at the issues of innovation organizational structure, financing structures, curriculum, pedagogical methods, leadership training, and actually all the way to how we recruit students. How do we identify those? In fact, what's the likelihood of success when we know who to recruit and who in fact should be uh, in the health education? And, the la and the, therefore, in the Lancet Commission, it talks about what we need to be in 21st century, from a science base to from to a problem base to a system base, where we look at companies driven and health system education altogether. From the way of learning from informative, that is you become an expert by learning skills, to formative by having socialized and values and we are professional, to transformative, where in fact your change agents, such as the people in this room, change the way we do things to make it better. And as you saw in the earlier slide from uh, uh, Dean Shaker, we need to mobilize leadership everywhere at all levels. We have to enhance more investment into education, align accreditation, and strengthen global learning. So I would say the world is in need of a global health education reform. And reform must be globally informed but locally specific. You heard that earlier, 
that actually every country's accreditation is country dependent. But what we are here today is to say, let's inform each other what's needed, agree so we can actually influence what's locally specific. And moving forward, let's make sure that we are professionals that connect with patients, identify problems, and imagine new solutions, and of course, let's really look at what's exciting ahead of us. Transformative, interdependent, professional for equity in health. Thank you very much.